Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good day. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step workshop. My name is Herb and I am an alcoholic. Please join me in this prayer that is really a plea for intervention, an open mind and an open heart, a gift. God, please set aside everything. I think I know about myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps and us and you. For an open mind and a new experience with myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer, God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Well, we've uh, had quite a journey, and we've been at it almost nine months. And from my perspective, we have completed the um, unpacking of the big book through the directions on page 75 about step five. As I've mentioned many times, the book suggests on, I think it's page 25, Bill says we're rocketed into a fourth dimension, rocketed into a fourth dimension. We get aboard the rocket in step one and it takes us to where it's going. The end orbit in the rocket, the destination, the intention is to be in orbit around the light. But this is a second stage that we're in. The second stage of Removing the obstacles in us to the sunlight of the spirit in us, removing the obstacles in us to the power that is in us. We made that decision in step two, that there is a power and that is deep inside. We made that decision in step three, that that power is there deep inside and we can have a relationship with it. And it's available to help. It is the source of help. We made those decisions in steps two and three. And then we entered into a very long gauntlet. And I use that term very intentionally here tonight. We entered into a gauntlet. Bill uses the term in step six in the 12 and 12. We uh, are brought from being children to being adults. And so, although he doesn't say these words, it wasn't really that much in the culture at the time, 1939. It certainly is in our culture, especially after the 80s, where there was so much concern about rite of passage. The rite of passage from immaturity to maturity, from childhood to adulthood. That's what steps four through seven are especially. I've termed it that second stage of the rocket launch, which is establishing a relationship with ourself. Well, we spent a lot of time analyzing, identifying the instincts in us as I've identified them, at least my interpretation of the big book that says, Clearly, resentment, fear, and dishonesty. Dishonesty pretty much wrapped around the whole sexual inventory. I've added to it secrets, guilt, and shame. <clears throat> We've identified them. 
And Bill suggested at the beginning of the inventory instructions on page 64 that we want to look at the truth and the values and the facts, the underlying causes and conditions and the exact nature. Well, that's how I presented it because that's how it had been progressively presented to me over time. We stepped outside of the actual fundamental literal instructions in the big book in every instance because the men who took me through the steps had an interpretation of what the big book and Bill Mil Wilson might have meant and their interpretation had given them a freedom so they passed that on to me and I passed it on to you. On page 62, Bill's very clear in, about unmanageability. We spent some time looking at our powerlessness in step one. Certainly about our addiction. That's why the, that's the presenting problem why most of us are here. Some form of addiction, some form of repetitive behavior over which I have no control that leads to negative results and consequences whether that's a substance addiction or a process addiction. And after giving up on all kinds of efforts in human help, we decided to make a commitment to a very invisible resource. And that was our faith decision. And at each stage of the step four process, it was reinforced in the big book. You can identify resentments, you can analyze them, you can talk about them. You just can't get rid of those deep ones, so you pray. You can analyze your fears, you can write from a different perspective on them unpacking them or creating vision statements and turnarounds like we did. But in the final analysis, the big book says you pray for its removal. And then very clearly, and in a couple ways, in the sex inventory, Bill says, yep, we can remember, we can write, we can analyze, <clears throat> we can talk about it. But on our own power, we can't even create the principles that will guide us in a healthy way, healthy principles. And even if we do create healthy principles, we don't have the power to adhere to it, to allow those principles to be operative in our life. I'm using my words, of course. This is a review of step four. And so we pray both for the knowledge of the principle, especially in the response to question number nine, what should I have done instead? And once we have the principles, we pray for the power to incorporate them effectively in our lives. Well, we finished it, page 75, and uh, page of, uh, uh, 71, and then 72 to 75 says, now we got to read it to somebody. Well, we don't got to. It's a suggestion that we read it literally. And, and I reviewed step five with you last week. There may still be some questions about it. The key concept of step five is confession. That word's not in the big book. Bill avoided it because it's a word that the Oxford group uses. I'm assuming that he wanted to distance himself from the Oxford group. <clears throat> but I'll use it because it really represents what we're doing. Uh, a sense of transparency is what I mm, emphasize throughout the discussion. Although it's not therapeutic, it, it's very therapeutic, especially if you commit to pulling the curtain back on all the secrets, all the areas of discomfort, embarrassment, tension, 
all the things that you don't want to talk about or you have an inclination to not talk about because it's either too embarrassing or nobody's business. Those are the very things that need to be talked about. We're shining light on the darkness in step five. A process that brings its own healing. I've never yet participated in a step five experience, either my giving the fifth step or receiving the fifth step that wasn't healing for both parties. An experience of deep listening in prayer to the sacredness of somebody's life. And, and normally what happens when we are saying out loud and consecutively what we've written in silence over many weeks or months or sometimes years, when we are saying it out loud consecutively, we have an experience <clears throat> that we may not have had before of the impact of our life on ourselves, let alone our impact of our life on other people. And normally the curtain again is pulled back on our delusions and our illusions. Our unhealthy beliefs are revealed and our corrupt motives are revealed. That self-centeredness that Bill talks about academically on page 62 and in black and white <clears throat> becomes technicolor in step five. I'm going to remind you, it's my recommendation that you do not throw away or destroy or burn your fourth and fifth step notes at this point, because we're now going to enter in the sixth step, which is to name more obstacles, our character defects, and then we're going to enter into the eighth step, which is to name the harms we've done to others, and much of that material has been at least noted. Many times I use the word parking spot in our material in preparation of our step four, and perhaps may have come out of some notes you have or your person who's hearing your fifth step might have as a result of the fifth step hearing process. So don't destroy it, don't burn it. It will be the source of your step six and your step eight, or at least a partial source of it. Bill talked about a spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom. And you might remember it. And I probably showed this PowerPoint at that time when we looked at step two, page 47. Bill doesn't use the term foundation. He uses the term spiritual arch. He assumes there's a foundation and he's talking about it in step one. but he clarifies it in step two. This step two being the cornerstone. A cornerstone is placed on a foundation. The stronger the foundation, obviously, the more stable the spiritual arch is or the arch in the construction metaphor. Step two, that willingness. Quite frankly, you'll see a echo in step four. You'll see an echo in step six and step eight and step 10. Willingness. Willingness to name all of the even steps. Fundamental to their effectiveness is our willingness. Bill says a willingness to believe, just the willingness is the cornerstone. And then he continues with the metaphor in step three, he calls step three, 
that decision to turn to have a relationship, the keystone. But as I mentioned then, and I'm going to re-mention it now, because it's months since we've looked at this, <clears throat> he, he talks about the fifth step at the end of page 75. He mentions this. Now we've walked through the spiritual arch to the new freedom, but he doesn't talk about any place in between step three and step five, that anything is a building block. Step four, perhaps the resentment is one of the building blocks in the spiritual arch. Perhaps fear, perhaps sex, perhaps dishonesty and secrets as I've illustrated them. So what's the whole point of this? Fourth step. Well, I kept painting the picture of freedom and that's what he painted at the beginning in step two. Freedom is the, the total point of the step process all the way through nine. But certainly Bill talks about an, uh, building a spiritual arch through which we walk to freedom. And there are promises at the end of step five. We meditated on those last week, I believe. But here we are now looking at Step six, defects of character. There's very little in the book. There's a paragraph, page 76. I asked you to read that paragraph and to highlight it. If we can answer to our satisfaction, okay, big book literalist, if we can answer what? Remember the questions on page 75? Have you omitted anything? Is your work solid? Are the stones in place? Cement and mortar? So if we can answer to our satisfaction at the end of our step five meditation, yeah, I've done the best I can. I really have done consciously the best I can. That's really the answer. Don't dwell on it. It's not about reviewing anything. You've done that in the meditation at the end of step five. We then look at step six. All right, let's take a look at it on page 59. <clears throat> step six. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Well, all right. What's the assumption then? Certainly willingness to be ready. But look at that. It's saying God removes our character defects. It tickles me today when I hear in rooms, I'm working on my character defects. Good luck. You're powerless over your defects of character in the same way you're powerless over your addiction. You've heard me say that about many things. That's the implication of no choice and powerlessness. That's certainly the statement here. Step six is an acknowledgement that we have the defects and once again, we're powerless. And that's why step seven is so important. We ask God to remove these shortcomings. He says humbly. Next week, <clears throat> I want to take a look more deeply at step seven. I'm going to avoid talking very much about step seven tonight, except in reference to step six, because that's the whole point. We make a list. We're willing to change and be changed. And then we pray. Humbly. Next week, read the, the second paragraph on page 76, if you haven't already done it. <clears throat> it's just the prayer. But this time I want you to, after you read it, is to write out your own seven-step prayer based on the 
words and phrases and meaning of the prayer on page 76. It's the same assignment I gave you for step three. Again, not to improve the prayer, but to understand the prayer. The prayer starts, my creator. Very interesting. I'll comment on it next week. Humbly, he says on page 59, step seven, is the first word in step seven. Chapter seven in the 12 and 12. Please read that. It's his wonderful essay on humility. Humility comes from the Latin word humus, H-U-M-A-S. It means earth or dirt. It might be H-U-M-U-S. <clears throat> it means earth or dirt, common as, not, not less than, just common, not unique, not special. All human beings have defects of character. All human beings have shortcomings. Oh, look at that. Bill uses two different words. You've maybe heard, and you may even participate, you may have read articles on the difference between a defect of character and a shortcoming. Some of them are quite intelligent and quite helpful, but none of them are necessary. I listened to a tape from Bill being interviewed by people <clears throat> about some of the step work, and somebody asked him, well, Bill, what's the difference in step six between a defect of character and step seven, a shortcoming? And Bill just laughed right there on the tape. And he said, oh, I was taught in my English classes not to use the same words in consecutive sentences. Those are synonyms. They mean the same thing. For me, that ended the discussion. Back to page 76. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which have admitted are objectionable? So that's part of the process. Now, Bill doesn't tell us to make a list of character defects. That was part of my development in my own step process to make the list because if I want to be ready to ask to have them removed, I probably should know what they are. That was my logic on it. It's not an instruction in the big book, but I'm giving it to you to make a list of your character defects. You made reference to some of them in your resentment inventory, especially column four. Question number nine. Maybe some other areas. It became very apparent where you have some shortcomings. You may have seen some in your fear inventory. You certainly saw some in your sex inventory. You certainly saw some in your secrets and your dishonesty. So throughout the step four inventory, you will have identified some. So I, I suggest you just do a brain dump, a gut dump, a heart dump, depending on the area that you're exploring in yourself. And then go back to your step four and step five notes. It's not about a long list. I probably had 35 character defects that I made a list of. On Saturday, I had done my step five on a Friday. <clears throat> I did my, oh, probably a couple hours worth of work on step six. On Saturday, I did my step seven on Sunday. I'll talk about that next week. <clears throat> so it took me a couple hours. If you spend more than two, maximum three hours on step six and seven, you're overdoing it. I'm saying that to set some parameters for you. No, 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 no rules, just guidelines, as you know. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things we have admitted are objectionable? So it's important that once you take a look at your character defects and your shortcomings, that on each one you pray and ask, am I ready? Am I willing to have this removed? 
I have lots of resistance from some of the men I work with who feel that some of their defects are their best assets. That's a conversation that we have to have. <laughs> How can a defect be an asset? Well, somehow they've got it in the mind that this has helped them navigate life. Then I have to remind them that, of course, they're in a program of recovery from their addiction, so they didn't navigate so well. It is not an asset. It becomes, all right, it becomes an asset. Our liabilities will become our assets, Bill says very clearly in the book, because they will be uh, uh, our ability to be the wounded healer to use our experience to have identification with other people who have the same experience and they can get some hope from your healing that allows them to commit then to their own healing. Can God now take them all, every one? The second question, not just this one and that one, but all, and, and quite frankly, without your permission in the sense of specificity. The six and seven don't talk about specifics. They talk about general. God remove all the character defects. Well, you have to ask yourself, do you really believe that God will? And do you believe that God can? Huge questions of faith. You might want to revisit steps two and three in the light of that question. If we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. Please remember that line. It was a life-changing line, fortunately, that I remembered that weekend. On Sunday, not Saturday. If we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God, that's a prayer, to help us be willing. You see, the whole point of this process is the deflation of the ego at depth. So we name them. And that's what I did. I mentioned I had approximately 35 character defects, gross stuff, not, not the mosquitoes, but the gross stuff. And then I'm fairly analytical, you know that already. <clears throat> so I took a look at that and I thought, well, I, maybe to really get to understand them coming from my psychology background, I should see how, how they're, the patterns or the, how they're related. And I was able to distill those 35 into about 10 different families, as I perceived it. Procrastination is a fancy name for fear. Resentment, quite frankly, is the fancy name for anger. Denial is a psychological term for camouflage, hiding. So I created about 10 different categories and that seemed to work pretty well. So I thought, well, I'm gonna to try to distill them down some more to see if I can get to what Bill had asked us to do on page 64, the underlying causes and conditions. Well, that's what I got. Now, I wasn't, this was my very first effort at doing the step, so I wasn't anticipating any outcome, but this was the outcome I got, reversing the order going from behavior to thoughts to beliefs to motives. And I saw, oh my, look at that. The big book is actually absolutely correct. Instincts gone awry are the sources, and of course, Bill says the ultimate source, the the, the ultimate uh, sort of riverhead, if you will, headstream. I'm not sure exactly what the right words are in geology, but the place where it all comes from is self-centeredness, selfishness and self-centeredness. That's the root, he says. And I remembered on Saturday that willingness was 
the key here to have them removed. And there was nothing on that list that I was attached to. The man had asked me to not only make a list, but to pray about my willingness and to review each one in prayer. All of those 35 resentments to see if in fact there was anything I wanted to hold on to. And I saw that they were all contributing to the lack of quality in my life. Entirely, I looked up the word in a dictionary completely. Ready, I looked up the word prepared, inclined, eager. I'm not sure I was eager, but that's what's in the dictionary. Defect, fault or blemish, vulnerable. Character, an aggregate of unique qualities which constitute personal individuality, makeup, or nature. Because I've done some work in psychology and personality theory, <clears throat> And in trying to make the uh, workshop more effective, I've added to the way of life document. First, I have this illustration in the way of life document on page 30, the one on the PowerPoint. But then I have on page 31 from the DSM, you've looked at it before in unmanageability when we were talking about the nature of unmanageability, selfishness, and self-centeredness. <clears throat> we looked at this as a sort of a preview of a personality disorder. And the DSM says it's a personality disorder is a pattern of deviant or abnormal behavior that the person doesn't change, even though it causes emotional upsets and trouble with other people at work and in personal relationships. I mean, that's an official professional sentence. You have a way of life document. I'm assuming you downloaded it. It'd be worthwhile to read that page. Not because the piece at the bottom applies to you. It might. Shades of gray. It's maybe a relative term from a scale of one to ten, as I've talked about before. The personality is a disorder of narcissism. There are nine characters or indicators of uh, that uh, diagnosable and irremediable, meaning it can't be fixed, personality wrinkle. For me, it, it very much was parallel with the bedevilments in my particular case, my particular personality. So it was particularly relevant, as I've mentioned before. But I'm not saying that it's pandemic to all human beings. I am not saying that at all. But it might give you a little pause and some grist for the mill in your prayer meditation. On the following pages, <clears throat> I spent quite a bit of time, well, several years actually, studying personality, as, especially in the area of what's called the Enneagram pages 32 to 33, way outside of the big book at this point, but some people have found it helpful because they were having trouble identifying character defects. Oh, they can look at that chart and go, yeah, 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 but it's not specific enough. And so they had questions about it, and I had taken the time to list the character defects in various personality configurations in this study called the Enneagram. Enea, E-N-N-E-A, is Greek for nine. Gram is just a constellation of how it fits in a pattern. I'm not going to teach on the Enneagram. You don't need to know much about the Enneagram. The whole purpose of these two or three pages, let me just see how many I got, two pages, uh, is to give a list of character defects, not as an official list from the Enneagram or an official list from psychology at all. But this will be a prompter to remind you if, in fact, you have any ambiguity about character disorders. So, for instance, somebody asked me, 
uh, about procrastination when I or superficiality. All right, these are words that are on here: ruthless, aggressive, rebellious, negative, rationalizing, obsessive, impatient, hopeless, depressive. We won't have them all, of course, but we will have some of them. The reason I like the Enneagram that it's based on an ancient tradition handed down orally for thousands of years, actually, and then finally codified in the last hundred years <clears throat> by professionals. And it stems from the three instincts fight, flight, and freeze. So that was the basis of how I approached step four. Anger, fear, and dishonesty. The theory is that everybody has all three, of course, instincts, their survival instincts. Some people are anger-based, some people are fear-based, and some people are shame-based as a predominant instinct. But everybody has them all. I don't know whether it's genetic and or cultural. Nature or nurture is the terms used in psychology. It, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It just matters that we under, I think it matters that we understand it as the exact nature of where it comes from. These are instincts for survival. It's not a negative judgment because you have a dominant reaction to reality of anger or fear or shame. We're just naming it. We're not judging it. We're evaluating it. We're not condemning it. So there are those three instincts, anger, fear, and dishonesty, fight, flight, and freeze. And there are three variations on each one of them. Three times three is nine. That's the teaching on Enneagram. That's as deep as I'm going to go, very superficial. I'm explaining it. I'm not asking you to understand it. I'm not asking you to do additional work in it. I'm just saying this is a resource for you in case you need it. But I wanted to explain it a little more than uh, just indicating the definition of the words. You'll note also that on page 34 that there's a diagram that you've seen before in the fear inventory, not because it's in the big book, but because I had an experience with the fourth column in the resentment inventory of a turnaround, and I wanted to have the same kind of turnaround in the fear inventory, so I created that matrix, and now I want to have the same kind of turnaround in the resentment area, excuse me, in the character defects area. And so the first column is the character defect. What is my behavior? All right, we're already very clear on all of that. But here's a question then that helps us plumb deeper into the exact nature, the underlying source and cause. What am I defending? What am I defending? See, this is about survival instincts. What am I defending when I have this reaction that I call a character defect? Character defect is not only the inclination, it's the behavior. Not only do I get angry, but then I speak angry or I act angry. So it's a combination of the inclination comes from the instinct and the behavior probably comes from lack of ability to contain it. We ask again in that column three, what, what is the benefit or the payoff for this reaction? There's no right or wrong answer. These are stimulus questions for you to get underneath it. 
looking at the behavior, not looking at the thoughts and the feelings, but looking at the behavior that demonstrate this is evidence of a character defect. So what would it be if I had the virtue? Same kind of question is in the fear inventory. Virtue coming from the Latin virtus, the strength, the opposite of the defect. What if I had that asset that's opposite? Arrogance, perhaps, as a character defect. That's personal. That's where I came from all the time without knowing it. Well, obviously, humility. Well, maybe not obviously, but to me, obviously, the opposite would be humility or a realistic appreciation of myself and others. There's so many, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer here. There's this, this is the springboard for the development of some deep, deep reflection. And then what behavior would this virtue manifest? So that I may not be able to develop the virtue on my own power, but I can certainly see how it looks in behavior and aspire to that as part of my vision for the day. Who would God have me be as part of my meditation question? As I mentioned in our, my teaching on step 11, in the morning, getting guidance to deal with the character defect du jour of yesterday. Because these are the impediments in us. I stay with the metaphor of the shadow, the clouds that are obstacles or block us from the sunlight of the spirit. The whole point of step four is to remove the shadows, the darkness. The whole point of step six is to remove the shadows, the darkness. The whole point of step eight, when we get there in a couple of weeks, actually, we're going pretty quickly now, is to name it and understand it and then pray for its removal and take some action and be accountable. All of that I'll be talking about next week in step seven. But keep in mind, it's about progress. I'm saying that, and I'll say it con continually, because there's never going to be perfection. Bill got it on page 60. He got it absolutely right. We're not saints, and we'll never be perfect. Never, never, never. We're material beings. By nature, material is corruptible. We are born, but the moment we're born, we begin growing and then dying. So for next week, just to be clear, we'll review the list that you have, any thoughts or questions that you have about what we talked about today. We've got plenty of time. We'll be talking about it some more. And then on Monday, we'll talk about it some more. The teaching of uh, step six, the reading from the big book and from the 12 and 12. It's a strong suggestion to read steps six and seven from the 12 and 12. It will really help. It's a wonderful commentary. All right. So if you have questions or comments, concerns about anything that I've said or anything that you've observed or experienced, um, now would be the time to raise your um so i i get that step six comes after step five and it, we shouldn't stay too long in it um or you know it's not something that the way you're describing it it's really because we don't do any work there in the sense that we are we we got the awareness in step four we gave it in step five and step six is just us kind of going back to i think to to step three kind of surrendering our character defects to 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 to, to god or to our higher power yeah so my 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 question to you is i guess I mean, I find myself 
like finding out more character defects as I, as I, you know, work the program as I, I work step 10, 11 and 12, like, Oh, <laughs> I, you know, I have, you know, I have, I, I tend to, to be mean to like punish myself or limit myself or self fragilate myself, like things like that, um, that are not helpful, nor to me, nor to others. Right. It's, you know, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not presenting my best self uh, to be of service. Um, other things is like, I don't, I avoid making any financial decisions regarding my finances. So there is irresponsibility, but I didn't quite get them like first time when I did four five and six. Right. So, I mean, right. I, I'm just saying, I feel it's an ongoing discovery <laughs> to know like our, to get to know ourselves. Um, yes. Yes. And, and 100% think about the metaphor, the dimmer switch. All right. right. The longer right. you're in program and uh, stay gently pressed up against the dimmer switch, you know, doing the work of 10, 11, and 12, or maybe occasionally redoing one through nine, the lights get brighter. And what happens when the lights get brighter? Oh my goodness, I see more. Right. Good news and bad news. So, absolutely. In fact, you've heard me use the term thaw out. Right. It, it, it can, for me, it continued for years that thawing out. All right. I mean, 20 plus years when I was doing the work of the steps. And I can and I, I still consistently go, oh, there's, there's a nuance that I can address, or maybe not so much of a nuance, you know, that kind of thing. So, yes. But that's again what step 10 is about. Uh -huh. Okay. But also what step six and seven is on a laser focused basis. Now, I'm going to talk a lot more about the practicality of the application when we get to step seven next week, um, because it's a very powerful combination, six and seven, especially as, as I've experienced it. I guess my well okay so one thing is a comment and the other is a question one is that i'm i'm finding myself because i'm so any tips i guess is what i want I'm, I'm still working on step four but am really intrigued by this way of doing six and seven so anyway i'm just finding that a little confusing because i'm still in in four and um well tell me what's confusing um, I feel like I'm losing track because my head's sort of in four. I'm losing track of the sort of the teachings of six and seven. I mean, I guess the good news is it's all recorded and I can go Number back. Number one, there are written, the written assignments you have. All right? Yeah. And number two, it is all recorded. So, yes, I, I really understand that there are lots of people who won't finish their fourth step before the end of the year. But we need to move on in order to get the book unpacked with the suggestions. And thank you for bringing it up because I am asking you to sample it so that you're following the directions, even though you're not on step six, you haven't done step five, you haven't finished step four. Yes, 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 yes. I'm recognizing that. And you're helping me really clarify the assignment right now. And that is... So are you aware of uh, three to five character defects? Great. Put them down. Don't do any research. Do the reading. That's easy. I mean, well, relatively easy. Do the reading yeah. and the highlighting. And, yeah. and, then, and, and make a note of three to five character defects. I'm yeah. so glad you asked the question because that makes it very practical. And you just, I'm pretty confident each one of us knows off the top of our head and heart some of the major picadillos that we have, right? <laughs> and right. then and, and then and then go back to do your fourth step work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing was that I can't uh, my my step guide after I did my um whatever that's called. Oh, sex inventory, the relationship deal suggested that I go back and were there any resentments on two of these? One was a relationship and one was a friendship. And I from like 30 or 
almost 30 years ago, I guess. Um, and although I wasn't aware of a resentment, I'm certainly aware of harm done. Making so, those. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in, a, in two weeks, I'll be giving the assignment on step eight. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. We're moving ahead now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I guess. There, anyway, I just sort of wanted to say it out loud. And see no, I'm glad doing. you did because it helped me clarify some of the assignment. I think for people, it gives them a sense of, oh, okay. Yeah. I can do the reading and, and prepare for a discussion. I don't have to do any other work. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. And could I share something that, since you like words, I came across <laughs> something that helped me the other day, and I wanted to just read it to you, if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. I get caught up in the stuff of the world, <clears throat> fear, worry, and then I came across this passage, and maybe it won't mean anything to anybody else, but it, it got my attention. This is written by a fellow by the name of Mark Morford, a journalist, and he wrote, Realize that for every ongoing war and religious outrage and environmental devastation and terrorist attack plan, there are a thousand counterbalancing, counterbalancing acts of staggering generosity and humanity mm -hmm. and art and beauty happening all over the world right now on a breathtaking scale from flower box to cathedral. Resist the temptation to drown in fatalism to shake your head and sigh and just throw in the karmic towel. Realize that this is the perfect moment to change the atmosphere of the world, to step right up and crank your personal volume right when it all seems dark and bitter and offensive and acrimonious and conflicted and bilious. There's your opening. And one of the things that happened when I read this and came back to center, as a result, was I realized that one of the things I experienced in this workshop is exactly what he said. Yeah. Acts of staggering generosity. Yeah. Certainly you, but also I just want to say thank you to all of you who have shared in this workshop. Yeah. Um, I, I am moved. It inspires me. It helps me lean into my discomfort and keep going. And it is incredibly powerful. And, and one of the ones I want to thank the most is sitting right here next to me because <laughs> she joined me in coming along. Um, but I just want to say thank you. I'm, um, it's what you share, your willingness, the courage that you show has an enormous impact. And I know you don't know this when you share something. I'm just one of the people that tell you yeah. it's had a huge impact on me and, it, and it's, it's changing my life. So thank you. Thank you. And, and reading that brilliant writer, by the way, just a brilliant, yes. brilliant use of terms. I mean, just, I mean, like a surgeon, just precision. It was wonderful. And what I've talked about is the change of attitude. What he said was wonderful, a change of atmosphere. Mm. That was great, a change of atmosphere. Well, of course, they're correlated. When I change my attitude, I change the atmosphere in which I live. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I wanted to talk a little bit about my plan uh, right. going forward on my fourth step. Good. So what I did was I went through everything I'd done so far and looked at it. And what I realized was I didn't have column four on several of the resentment yep. that I thought I had already done. Yep. And, um, and that kind of thing. So I got it all organized and redone and put in my binder um and i've set aside tuesdays and thursdays to work on it there you go as a at a minimum so those are the dates that it's on my calendar and um i've talked to my sponsor about setting up once i get through all of the resentments because i've already done the sex inventory and the fear oh. as i finish all of the uh which i'm going to go back through them again too as a part of the final process. Maybe. But, um, well, Careful. look at them. Well, maybe. <laughs> why, why would you be doing that? Uh, go back and just look at them and see that I finished them. Like Oh, I see. Like sort I of finished. a review for completion. Yes, 
Yes, I see that. But don't be re rereading and rethinking and reprocessing and rewriting. Don't do that. Right, right. Just just to be sure I finished and that yeah. it's completed. No, I, I like that a lot. Yeah. And um and so I'm hoping to be done by the end of October. Yep. Um but it may be well into November before I'm finished. Well, you, the, you, but, but, but you're, you've got a target date, not a deadline. You've got a plan and you're going to do the best you can with it. That's wonderful. And it's specific. Yeah. Okay. How many resentments are you planning on finishing? Um, Ten. And yeah, I've finished good. completely two and have some that I've done the first, the column three on. Yep. Good. Great. So, yep. So um, take a deep breath and pray the set aside prayer and stick to your schedule and talk to your sponsor about whether or not you're sticking to your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Yeah. That's Thanks, what. sir. I've discovered that if I'm in, if I'm working with a therapist or a spiritual director where I'm going to be talking about anything that's important. They have to be, I have to know that they understand the 12 steps. Oh, I, I, I think it's better. I don't think it's critical or necessary, but I think it's certainly better. Yes, it makes it much more effective. Well, and for me, I think it, I think as I was listening there, I think the reason it's so easy for, well, it's not always easy, but I'm willing to share from my heart in a group like this is that I trust I have a trust in the process. I have worked the steps enough to know that they're not going to kill me. They are going to make it, whatever I'm going through, it is going to be better if I just keep work going through the step and I can trust the process. That's why I think when I work with a therapist or even a spiritual director, I just, it's, it, it somehow builds trust. It's just easier here than if I'm with, a, even then they can tell me this is a safe environment. I know it's a safe environment, but there's something about the 12 steps that is sure. the, right. the process is safe. Yep. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. I just kind of, it just, just kind of listening uh, listening, it just makes me think of the spiritual axiom. It's really what got me. And, um, and when, and when we're, when things get, are getting to us that much, how in touch with our higher power are we really, you know? And, um, that one really got me because I finally realized that, you know, when I, I've kind of said it before, but I found myself in a group of people and everybody was okay, but I was the one losing my mind and it <laughs> happened enough times. And it kind of hit me when I really heard that. And I just said like, wow, it's actually me. Like there's something going on. And I had no idea what that meant at that time, right. but I actually got to see the fact that there was something going on with me and I didn't really, you know, I didn't know what that meant at the time, but, um, but, uh, and so I think what helps, what helps you stay plugged into maybe staying further away from being out of touch is, is a simple prayer, right? Like the way you say it, um, upon awakening, we ask God for guidance. I'm not sure that because our best thinking got us here. And then recently I heard, I heard, I heard you and Dr. Berger, I, I think you guys were commenting that that's actually not bad news. <laughs> you know, that, that, that can be heard both ways. Because here we are, I mean, we have a choice to be here. And, um, and so it just depends on how you look at that, you know? Right, right. And so that, that is usually, when you hear someone say that, it's usually taken in a negative way. But, I mean, a lot of us can, can say, like you guys did that day, that that's actually a good thing. And for a lot of us that realize that it actually is. Um, so yeah, to me, to me, um, that's just when I, when I hear someone really struggling, it just makes me think of step 11, you know, and what are you doing to ask your higher power to help you on a daily basis? 
because we cannot like if we're super critical about what we think what other people are thinking and all those like all that stuff is just thinking and 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 when our own mind is telling us things that seems real but it's not always real yeah. it's not it's it, it may not be reality even though it's in our head oh for sure <laughs> Oh, well, that's a given. That, that's where I really don't trust my mind. But the, the key here, and, and somebody else had mentioned it, was it's about trust. And uh, as uh, I've heard, uh, as I've said before, <clears throat> trust is earned. It's never given. And it's earned with consistent behavior. But at some point, you're so right in terms of steps two and three, that that's really about an act of faith. And there's risk involved and there's stretch involved because there's no evidence that it's trustworthy until, in fact, you stretch and risk and then have a positive experience. Yeah, hopefully that's what's going to happen. You're going to have a positive experience. But there is a risk to the stretch and the behavior based on speculation. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I was in a room that wasn't a 12 step room. And the message one day was the fact that if your life is that out of control, like, can you ask yourself about your own faith? It was that simple. And it wasn't a 12 step room. And yeah. yet that was the question to the group of people that were there that day yeah. was yeah. if life is that unmanageable and that everything is just, you know, everything is what it is. Right. And everything's bad. And, you know, and, every, and so I just thought that was really interesting because I've had that experience in groups other than 12 step groups. Right, for sure. Yeah. And so the, the crossover is amazing with, with yeah. that. Um, well, because it's all about human behavior and there's very little variation in human behavior. It's really very, very predictable, both the negative and the uh, positive. It's very predictable. Fortunately, now we have lots of science about it. And that's, that's what we're doing here. We're learning about our own patterns, our own dynamics, our own behavior, and then becoming conscious enough that we're, we're going to take responsibility to make decisions to take risk and to stretch and to change. Huge to change. I didn't know that I had to change and I didn't know that I could change and I certainly didn't know the process of change. And step six and seven, as small as they are, they were probably absolutely central and dynamic in the change that I experienced. And I'll, I'll talk about that next next week when we do step seven. Thank you. Thank you. It does. But um, I, I kind of wonder if I'm on the right track. So if you're open to it, I'd like to read you one of my fear ones. Yes, please. Okay, awesome. Let me get to... So my fear, fear of getting sick with a disability or disease, developing more and more pain as I age. Yeah. Okay. And um, like, what if that comes true? What, what will happen then? And I put, I'll be unhappy. I'll be miserable. I, want, I won't want to be alive anymore. I won't enjoy life. Okay. What if all of that is true? I put... I'll be miserable. I'll spend my days in regret, wishing I'd done things differently. No one will want to be around me. I'll die miserable and alone. All right. Okay. And then now for the worksheet part, like but why wait, do I? So, oh, so I'm that, sorry. That, that seems like you, you got to sort of the end game there. I'll just die alone. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. You, you couldn't go much further than that. Um, and so then go to the worksheet. Great. I'm glad you're doing Okay. Yeah. And by the way, they all end that way. I'm, I'm alone and lonely and alone. And then I die. So that okay. seems to all be right. the common, that's the root. Like that's the worst possible thing in my mind. All that, right. Why, that's the common theme you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do I have it? And I, I wrote because eventually bodies wear out and there is at least a chance there will be pain involved. Yep. Highlight and then I, actually. <laughs> then I put what behavior is manifest. And I put, I do my best to exercise, eat right, take care of my health with all recommended doctor's appointments. And I take lots of preventative supplements recommended by my naturopath. 
Okay, so all very positive behaviors. Exactly. Around the fear. Did you have any uh, response to any type of negativity coming from this fear? Not really, because that right. that's all right. You, but then this did. is go ahead. But but this is what I wrote opposite of fear, and I put living in the moment. There, this is not a problem today trusting that god will provide me with what i need to deal with it if this ever does occur when and if it does occur all right and then right. i put what behavior would this virtue manifest and i put enjoying the moment more still taking care of myself um but out of the focus more on self-love and less out of fear yeah 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 all right so uh, what is your experience with both of those uh, projects? I'd say if if I were able to let go of the fear more and, and just trust that I'd be given what I need to deal with it in the moment, I'd enjoy the moment more. I'd be like just my energy would be I would be more free to focus on more productive things. And it's not like I spend hours preoccupied no. with right. this, right. right? but it is in my mind, you know, it is in my mind. And the reality is like, I mean, obviously I've, I've had some aging already and it's been okay. So I can just, tr I mean, maybe I could trust with God's help that it will continue to be okay. Even though obviously I'll age more and more as I get older and older yeah um so the first thing that you said that you discovered you can mm -hmm. a pattern that this is a theme that permeates many of your fears and or your thoughts or feelings this this concern about aging and loneliness and pain well well not so much that but basically that i'll i'll be miserable and die alone like that's they're, they're not, not all about aging and pain, but that's the at the bottom of each fear. And I've analyzed four so far, and I think okay. I have nine in all. So that's almost half already. Um, I that's the, that's the common theme in them all is that I'm miserable. I, I like chase everyone away or I drive everyone away rather. And then I'm I'm just completely consumed with misery and I die all by myself. That's the common theme. Okay, all right. Um, so perhaps you need to take a look at some additional work then with regard to the fear. And that is, what is that about in terms of dying alone? What is the fear of that? And that's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to answer mm -hmm. unless you want to, but that sounds like that that needs to be looked at a little bit. What we, we all essentially die alone, but <laughs> I know there might, right, be, right. there might be people in the room, but so take a look at that maybe. Okay. And then on the, other right. hand, on the other hand, I thought it was wonderfully positive that you connected in the fourth column, I think being the present moment and trusting. And then in the fifth column, you said to be more present. It sounds like just a wonderful mm, sort of a mm, vision statement to commit to is on a daily basis. I'm going to be more positive and more present. Mm. Okay. No, that, that totally works. Yeah. Well, that's All what right. you said. I mean, I'm, I'm repeating it back to you. Okay. I didn't make it <laughs> up. <laughs> I'm, I'm just reflecting it back to you with a little editorial kind of a, a nuance to it. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't, I mean, I'll be honest, you're, that that sheet, the, the, the little boxes are so small, I thought there is no way I can even begin to use it. So I just, I answered them all on a piece of paper, but you you made it very crisp with your feedback. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, and don't, yeah, don't be restricted by the form. Right. The, the form is merely a guide to explore to explore uh, your your feelings and your thoughts about it like you just did. Wonderful. I just have to tell you one more thing just to show how completely self-centered I can be. And I was shocked. So there was one week, it was a long time ago, but we couldn't get you right away. 
Like we had to search for you. You didn't show up when you were supposed to. And I think you were like five or 10 minutes late for whatever reason. Yeah. And you know, you're a little older, you're in your eighties. And, and my, I have to admit my very first thought was, oh my God, nothing can happen to him because the workshop's over and I'm not done with my work yet. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, that's horrible. That's no. horrible. No, it's just very, <laughs> no, I, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> no, and then, and then I, I thought, like, oh my God, that's terrible! I can't believe it. I just had to confess that. Anyway, um, that's wonderful. You, you're you're awesome. You're thank you so much. I'm so grateful for this workshop and for all your, the hours you volunteer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you that it's as it's. This may not be totally true, but it's as good for me as it is for you all. This mm. is. This is very helpful to me, and and mm -hmm. first, I enjoy it also. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Herb. You bet. Right. Hi, Herb. Thank you for calling on me. Um, I mentioned to you the last, I guess, the last time about how I was confronted with my with this awful gut emotional experience um, when I looked at the relationship that I had had with my husband, and this was when he was sober, and, um, and, and how, you know, I was just appalled when I, when it rose up, because I think all the prayer and meditation, all this work, it's just, it sets the stage, and I've had all, I've been, I've been like this, everything is coming to the surface. So I was, could, would you be willing to help me with the sex inventory that I did on this? It's not, you know, it's not graphic, yeah. but it is. No, no. yeah, absolutely. Points. It says, uh, how did this, the encounter or actual relationship begin? Well, my husband was a bottom alcoholic. We lost absolutely everything. And um, when he started his recovery, um, I guess this was about, I'm trying to think how many years. It was about three years. It was about four years into his recovery um, that this was taking place. I was in um, a food addiction program, and I have. I was going to a counselor who was also part of that. Would also. You want to get to the inventory, not okay. the story, okay? All right. So it says what happened. <clears throat> Um, I demanded my conjugal needs be addressed by him, and he was involved in all kinds of mischief that was ongoing and indifferent to my open and honest expression of that in that regard. What's the status now, or how did it end? <clears throat> we eventually separated. Um, he had a stroke and cancer and died within four months of the, of the separation and the diagnosis. Um, where had I been selfish thinking about myself? I demanded and I was, I was arrogant. I was um, violent that he fulfill my, his vows, used threats, manipulation, control and intruded on his person. All right. Where had I been dishonest? By thinking, thinking that I could find fulfillment in this way that I could change his mind about me uh, for my gain, not for his. All right. It was just justification. Um, where had I been inconsiderate? I gave absolutely no thought as to how my behavior would affect or harm him. I didn't respect him. And I didn't, um, I didn't have really a clue as to what he was struggling with in his sobriety because he would not, he was not open about any of that. Whom had I hurt? I hurt myself and my spouse and I would say ultimately my family. Did I arouse jealousy? I don't think I did, but disgust perhaps. Did I arouse suspicion? No. <clears throat> did I arouse bitterness? Yes. And he expressed it in verbal abuse and phys eventually physical aggression and hostility, which led to our separation. Where was I at fault? I refused to acknowledge um, that the relation, there was no relationship there really. 
that the marriage was over and I was hanging out of fear that I would be totally responsible for meeting all of my needs. No children were around at that time. They were all um, just about finishing college if they weren't already. Um, what should I have done instead? So that, that was where I got stuck on that. But I know that um, in all of it, I totally lost my dignity. Um, and that was not those, not, those are not the principles I held going into my marriage at all. They're not the ones that I even hold today. And the fact that they came up and, you know, hit, hit me in the throat kind of left me wondering. So in that same week, as I was praying, I was reading this very beautiful um, meditation and it was, it was about chastity, which gets a, and is really a negative connotation in, in many quarters. But it said <clears throat> that the relationship with another person that is free from all forms of possession and manipulation, control and intrusion is, is the goal. Um, it means respecting the other person in his or her freedom mystery, emotions, and unique vocation, as well as showing respect for his or her body. It's primarily a look of faith and love in which we perceive the deep, deep beauty of each person and what is unique and precious about them. We perceive the other person not as a reality at our disposal, and that's what I did. I, I perceived him as something that was disposable. Um, that but as holy ground that we can approach only by removing our sandals. And I thought, wow, you know, that struck a chord, but in a practical sense, what should I have done instead? So, well, yeah. if, you, if you were a, uh, uh, faced with it today, the same circumstances with your current consciousness, the same circumstances with your current consciousness, what would you think would be the healthy way of handling that same circumstance? Well, recognizing without deluding myself that there was a way of dealing with that in a sexual matter, it, it couldn't be it, in that situation. It certainly wait, 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 don't ask. Don't tell me what couldn't be. Oh, tell me what what you would do today with the consciousness and the principles you have today. That's the answer to the question, what would I do instead? If you were presented today with what you know about yourself and him and spirituality and healthy principles, how would you address the very same situation with him today? I recognize that I couldn't change the situation. That would be one, accepting reality. That's a good principle. <laughs> um, that certainly um, codependence was there big time. Um, well, all right. But let's, let's not get fancy with words okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Um, looking for him to satisfy my needs and not be responsible for myself. So I would at this in this new circumstance recognize that i am responsible for myself that i do not have to live in that situation that i am self-supporting through my own contributions which i was and i was really working toward that end with my counselor yeah um that um he, he was a man Usually conflicted. Well, wait, we're, we're not talking about him. Oh, that's right. I know. Um, so you're going to accept reality. You're going to accept the situation. You're going to be committed to being kind, kind and respectful. Kind. You're going to communicate in a way of respect and honoring his needs as well as your needs. And as you just said, bottom line, you his job is not to make you happy. Yeah. 
your responsibility is for you to take care of yourself. And then you have to define what that would look like. And, and there's no rules here. You have to define what it would look like for you to take care of yourself in a way that would be acceptable to you. Yeah. All right. And, yeah. and that, that, that would span the entire spectrum of, of options for you. What, but then what, was, what would be the healthy choices on your part? And we don't need to discuss that, but that's the right question. I, you know, and that that makes me feel good better because I did make healthy choices. I went back to school. Yeah, there I you got go. a degree. There you go. Yeah, and I was sixty three. All right, all right. <laughs> so you know, it there's you no, know, there's you can always get better. This is this is very pra you 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 really addressed a very practical situation very specifically, and thank you for sharing it with us. Let's pray the serenity prayer tonight so that uh, we get a sense of what we can influence, really our thoughts, our feelings, but especially our actions. We can call somebody, we can ask for help. Uh, and, and we'll make mistakes and we might not even ask the right people. And then eventually we'll ask somebody who can be very helpful. And that's, we develop wisdom that way, but it is a trial and error. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. <laughs>